Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, we just finished up what we think was our biggest BlizzCon yet, and we're really excited to see if it was also the best. Early anecdotes say it may be, but uh, all that feedback still coming in. I'm Sarah Lynn Smith. Uh, I'm the head of BlizzCon as about a year and a half ago, and I have Pete Eminger here, our vice president and head of global broadcast, and we're going to be talking to you about the content factory. Yeah, so whether it's BlizzCon or Overwatch League, uh, we love creating epic live experiences for our esports fans, both uh, live and online. And I'd actually love to turn it over to Pete so he can talk to you guys first. You want this? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so something that we actually say internally, and this is a great slide that shows it, is what we actually are in is the smile business. So, like, our goal is to entertain people. Like, that's really at its core um, what it is. That's how we sort of do everything. And if we look um, across the, the history of esports, so we have this group now called Activision Blizzard Esports, and we've been producing esports at Blizzard for over 20 years, so that started with StarCraft. And you can see on this slide here, um, we have some, a lot of legacy here with our current franchises. So Call of Duty, StarCraft, World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, and Overwatch. Um, in addition, we run a collegiate program, and that's under the TESPA banner, and that's fully in-house as well. So we have this pretty expansive um, content ecosystem that revolves around esports. And uh, something that's not as well always understood is we have it organized very similar to traditional sports. So you can see on the left, um, you can see sort of how Major League Baseball and the baseball ecosystem is organized. You have collegiate baseball across all of the colleges and NCAA. You have the minor leagues and various um, farm team ecosystems. You have the pro league, which is Major League Baseball. And then you also have this World League program, uh, which is basically the Olympics. And then if you look at three of our games, we actually have a very similar ecosystem structure. And this is very interesting because this is, at its core, how we sort of look at how we generate content. And you can see we have our TESPA level, which is for collegiate. Um, we'll just talk about Overwatch. We have our Overwatch Contenders, which is a seven-region uh, program. It's a pretty expansive program for the semi-pro um, community for Overwatch. We have Overwatch League, which I know everybody has heard a lot about previously. And then we have Overwatch World Cup, which um, was at BlizzCon this year. And that's a country-based program with over 40 countries that competed on-site at BlizzCon. And we see this really great rise up of uh, nationalism, of people cheering for their countries. It's a very similar ecosystem to the Olympics and baseball. And you can see how that mirrors across our other uh, esports programs, Call of Duty and Hearthstone as examples here. In addition, we actually um, have further parallels to traditional sports that I think aren't always as clear to people, but if you look at the NFL and Overwatch League, the ecosystem is almost identical. So just like the NFL, the Overwatch League has teams. Those teams are, um, they have team owners, they're essentially franchises, um, and the main goal of the Overwatch League is to create value both for the league and for the teams. And that's the same goal as with the NFL you can see that the way this is structured from a content perspective and a live broadcast perspective, we have a regular season, we have playoffs, we have all-stars, NFL has the Pro Bowl, and the NFL has the Super Bowl, we have a grand final. So you can see that the way this is structured is very similar. It makes it very approachable to a wider audience outside of just a gaming community. But from a gaming community perspective, here's what the Overwatch eSports ecosystem looks like in particular. So we essentially built a funnel type system to sort of support all of our content within the Overwatch eSports ecosystem. So at the top level, we have Overwatch League. You have to be at the top pinnacle of your career to be a pro player in the Overwatch League. Um, it sounds very obvious, but it's a very limited pool. The max roster size on teams is uh, 12, and there's 20 teams. So that's literally the maximum. And if you look at other traditional sports, it's exactly the same. There are max roster sizes and a limited number of teams in these leagues. If you start to go down the chain, you have Overwatch World Cup, which is still a pretty high tier of gameplay. You have to be a pretty expert player to play at that level. But it broadens the, the funnel of players a bit with um, the number of countries being determined just by who enters, basically. Below that, we have the contenders ecosystem, which widens that even further. Like I mentioned earlier, there are seven regional ecosystems for contenders, so this is a pretty expansive global program. Below that, we have amateur and open competition. And then something that's really unique here that's a good parallel to sports is you can actually just compete in the game against people. And so if we think about basketball, this is equivalent to basically playing streetball. 
So this is a very approachable ecosystem, and just like with traditional sports, if all you have for capability or time is to go out and play with your friends, you can do that. If you want to keep playing and progressing, you can play in a collegiate level, you can play in semi-pro, and if you make it to the pros, um, there's certainly a lot of rewards at that level for you. We get a lot of questions about our audience, and so I thought I would sort of use this as an example to sort of talk about this audience. So you can see that 70% lands in the demo of 18 to 34. The other interesting thing about the 18 to 34 demographic is that in the past year, Overwatch League is the only sport in the United States to actually grow in that demographic. So our viewership measured by AMA actually grew 13% um, in the past year. And again, it's the only traditional sport that actually grew audience in the 18 to 34 demo in the past year. These are all um, data and statistics that are managed and reported by Nielsen. So this is independent reporting. You can go verify this. In addition, our audience is heavily connected and digital. You can see, as an example, 75% have a Netflix subscription. It's heavily social. People talk over all of the various social channels um, and recruit their friends to play. And this is a very tech-savvy audience. You can see that many of them use an ad blocker, which if you're not a tech-savvy person, you probably aren't even familiar with what an ad blocker is. So, and you can see on the right, you can see how engaged this audience is in general with gaming. So if you think about how many hours are in a week, or how many hours maybe some of us work in a week, and you add up the numbers below, you're approaching 30 hours of gameplay engagement in a given week in this demo. So this is a, a very heavily... Um, engaged audience. What you can see on the left is sort of an example of, because we have such a heavily digital audience, the distribution environment is heavily digital as well. So we're on platforms such as Twitch, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, YouTube. Uh, in addition, we're on owned and operated websites and broadcasts. But in addition to that, we're broadcasting in multiple languages live around the world all at the same time. And this audience basically demands this kind of experience. They demand access to their content. They, de they demand uh, easy access to it and in multi-languages. Uh, one other cool thing is because in eSports, the game is inherently digital, we have a lot of capabilities that don't exist in traditional sports around content creation. So something that's interesting is to gather stats in traditional sports, you primarily have to watch them and record them manually. And if you want interesting stats like speed of players, you have to glue sensors to them. We do not have to glue sensors to any of our esports players to find out what they're doing in the game. We have access to all of that data. With all of that data, we can make great, rich digital experiences. Here you can see this example of Twitch All Access Pass that was available this past season for Overwatch League. You basically had the capability to select your own view, watch whatever player's point of view you wanted, get access to additional data, um, it was really great, rich experience for people who do want sort of this more immersive, um, hands-on experience and not just to sit and watch a passive show. And with that, I'll hand it back to Sarah Lynn to talk about BlizzCon. So this image here is one of my favorite activities. We really think about building BlizzCon with the community. There's a lot of production, of course, that we're taking on, but this is a 45-minute activity we call the March of the Murlocs, and this is the second year in a row we've done it. This is uh, you know, about 500 attendees that have dressed up in Murloc costumes, and the first year we did it was last year. We weren't sure how it was going to go, so we had uh, six employees that had the onesies on just in case, and hundreds of people showed up. So we just love this as a, as a contrast of how a community-focused uh, Blizzard and especially BlizzCon is. And a little bit more, I want to talk about how we think about uh, BlizzCon. You might assume it's a convention, and I hear people refer to it as a convention. Um, and there's a lot from conventions that we are trying to study and learn best practices. It might be, uh, you know, uh, keynotes and stage content, and also, you know, venue utilization and labor efficiencies. But uh, this year, in uh, 2019, we had five major global esports e programs. So we're also studying different uh, sporting uh, leagues, not limited to esports, but also, um, as Pete was mentioning before, you know, even the Olympics, the NFL, uh, you know, poker is very interesting for our game, like Horse Hearthstone. And so there, we're, we're studying uh, how people are integrating storylines into a live event, the role of uh, hosts and casters, uh, even competition formats, what's really appealing for the time slots we have available at BlizzCon. Uh, and also, we increasingly are trying to make an immersive experience, so we want to, uh, you know, study theme parks, like what is Disney doing for, you know, uh, really embracing their biggest fans? Uh, how do you make an immersive uh, experience by design, uh, bring in surprise and delight elements, all that sort of thing. So hopefully BlizzCon is uh, somewhere in the middle. 
And just a little bit more about what we are. Uh, you know, there's 40,000, over 40,000 live attendees. And uh, as soon as we put tickets on sale, they sell out in seconds. So we know the demand is much higher than what we can fit in Anaheim. And so we care very much about the broadcast experience, how we can make it more accessible to more folks. Uh, we had um, in 2019, uh, I'm sorry, in 2018, we had over 20 million people that were tuning in at some point over the weekend uh, for a, a lot of our free content. Opening ceremony is free content and all of our esports competitions. Uh, and that has over this year, over 250 broadcast channel endpoints for us. Uh, uh, we have seven fully produced stages across the show. So some of the vendors that work with us will say, this is not one event, it's seven events because of all the different stages we have. Um, like we said, five major global esports competitions culminating at BlizzCon. Um, we also have other panels that are just the devs getting up and talking about what it's like to be an artist, talking about the storylines. Um, and so that ended up being 37 non-esports uh, panels for us. I think there's over 160, uh, 160 VODs on BlizzCon.com. Uh, and, and so forth. A thousand press and influencers are there to cover all of the latest announcements, play our new games. Um, and as we were seeing, BlizzCon, even though it's only 40,000 employees, the attendees, they come, they stay, and they spend money, and they probably go to Disneyland as well. But we're seeing, a, you know, we have a very large economic impact uh, compared to other events of our size. We're actually very large. And uh, kind of like Pete was talking about, so the BlizzCon audience, what we know about them, we also have, you know, 75% are in that 18 to 34 year demographic. They're young and they're engaged. Uh, I'm really happy to say that 23% uh, are female that are attending BlizzCon, and we're seeing that trending upwards. So we are trying to figure out um, how to, uh, it, it's something I care about, you know, increasing that number for our online and also live attendees. So 87% are watching esports. Esports is an enormous part of the BlizzCon experience, and people love it. I mean, there's lots, you know, standing room only for the finals of, you know, five of our different esports competitions. It's a really rich part of the live and online experience. It's a very social group. Um, and so when we're thinking about the live attendees, it is slanted towards the U.S. and North America, but we're talking about the online viewers, that 20 million, or this unique product we have, I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, the virtual ticket. That is split across the globe. It's you know, basically 30% you know, in North America and the same in Europe and also in Asia. So it really is a global audience tuning into BlizzCon. Uh, but similarly uh, to what Pete was saying, you know, it's highly digital, it's global, um, and uh, we, we use uh, a network with, with eSports, so we have a lot of casters that are helping to localize uh, the different uh, eSports programs and, and uh, live content to their audiences. So again, it's over uh, 250 endpoints that we are connecting to. So, uh, we have um, the floor demos are the exclusive latest content coming from Blizzard developers, and we invite... Uh, you know, influencers to come actually stream at those floor demos and then share that back to their audiences, which is the only way that that, you know, audience of 20 million can actually see the new content being played live is from those demos. Yeah, so my final slide here is, is you know, just a little bit about something that we've done, like the pay-per-view experience for BlizzCon. Uh, this is something, you know, we'd like the virtual ticket to be the ultimate way to experience BlizzCon if you can't fly out to Anaheim and join us in person. And so uh, part of this is that we offer... Uh, in-game items from all the Blizzard IPs. It's kind of a celebration of all Blizzard games with these, you know, skins or, you know, mounts and pets and card backs and other things. But we also add, uh, have exclusive content for that virtual ticket audience. We feature something we call the All Access Channel. Maybe a good analog is thinking of the Bob Costas Channel if you're watching the Olympics where this is like your curated experience that's hitting all the highlights from, the, you know, two or three days of the show of BlizzCon. Like, again, we have lots of in-depth panels. I think you know, 37 different panels happening from our Blizzard devs and also from our community. Uh, and we tend to cap it off with uh, bands. We have a wonderful thing on our first day we call Community Night, where there's cosplay contests and art contests, music contests, and so forth. So the, the virtual ticket captures all of this and gives a lot of exclusive content to you know, fans that want to be uh, more there as much as they can without actually physically being there. Uh, and this product we localize in seven languages currently. Yeah, so just uh, we'll, we'll end here and just say that between uh, you know, broadcast, we have uh, Activision Blizzard Esports and BlizzCon. We love what esports is bringing uh, you know, to our communities, and we're very committed to the future here. Thank you.